Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for Continuing Church of God. I want to talk about the Days of Unleavened Bread. The faithful Christians keep the Days of Unleavened Bread. So let's talk about them. They're mentioned in the Bible. They're mentioned in both the Old Testament and New Testament. And also throughout uh, Church of God history. If you've got your Bible, you might want to go to Leviticus chapter 23, uh, starting in verse 5. And what we hear is, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So we see that we're supposed to keep the days of unleavened bread, and that those who obey God are going to eat unleavened bread for all of those seven days. Now, related to the New Testament, it should be noted that Jesus was killed during the daylight hours of Passover, according to Mark chapter 14, on the 14th day of the month called Abib. And he was buried, and we're going to go to John 19. He was buried just prior to the start of the first day of unleavened bread. And, for, for example, from the New King James, it says, therefore, because of the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross, should be staked on that Sabbath. For that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. And if you're Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic translation says, then the Jews, because it was the uh, parasive, that the bodies could not remain on the Sabbath day because it was a great uh, Sabbath day. And let me read from a different type of translation. It's called the message. Then the Jews, since it was the day of the Sabbath preparation, and so the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses after, over the Sabbath, it was a high holy day in that year. They petitioned Pilate that the legs might be broken to speed the death and the bodies taken down. Now verse 42, same chapter, says, So because it was a Sabbath preparation for the Jews, the tomb was convenient. They placed Jesus in it. So Jesus was put into the grave, the tomb, just before the start of the great Sabbath, the high holy day. And what day was that? Well, that had to be the first day of leavened bread. Even Roman Catholic and Protestant commentators uh, realize that. For example, uh, Jameson Fawcett and Brown, famous Protestant pro commentary, says, the preparation Sabbath eves, that the bodies may not remain overnight against Deuteronomy 21. On the Sabbath day, that Sabbath day was a high day, a great day, the first day of unleavened bread. Okay, so that's what Protestant commentators say. Now here's one from the, from the Hadic Catholic Bible commentary. And the Jews, because of the preparation that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that was a great Sabbath day, the first and great day of the Feast of Azim's. Now that's not a word we tend to use, but Azim's means unleavened. So Catholics, it's in the Catholic literature, but I grew up Roman Catholic. I never would have had any idea what the Feast of Azim's was if I had just read this when I was growing up as a kid. But now I looked at what words, what does this mean? And it means unleavened. Now let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 12. So I already see a connection to Jesus' burial, because Jesus was in the grave during the days of leavened bread. Now, if we go back to Exodus chapter 12, we'll pick this up in verse 15. It says, In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether they're a stranger or a native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. And... Uh, Today, as I speak, this is the first day of unleavened bread, which started uh, sunset uh, the evening before, well, and, and it ends sunset tonight. Now, are there Christian ramifications to the days of unleavened bread? We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, most professing Christians are aware that 1 Corinthians 5, 7 teaches that indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. They get that part somewhat at least a little bit, but they don't seem to actually observe the verse that happens next. 1 Corinthians 5, 8. And remember, this is from the New Testament. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor the leaven 
of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven puffs things up, unleavened bread is flat. When you buy a loaf of bread with leaven, okay, by now people are used to the fact that they're all puffed up. But if you actually pull all the leaven out there, you find it's a lot smaller. With something unleavened, basically what you see is what you get. And the, the, the sad thing is that most people who profess Christianity don't seem to be where they're supposed to keep any biblical feast. Um, although there's lots of reasons to do so. Now, let me interject. Since I mentioned I grew up Roman Catholic, I had no idea that Easter was supposed to be Passover. I had no clue. You say, that makes no sense. Well, just go to the Catholic, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church and it will tell you that what they call Easter was supposed to be Passover. Now, if you start to think through, it's like, wait a second, Passover was at night. They drank uh, uh, wine, uh, uh, washed feet, ate unleavened bread. But Easter's in the morning. They get up, look for the sun to come up and whatever. It's like, that's not really the same, but that's what they claim. And the, uh, going back to 1 Corinthians 5, this time I'll read all of verse 7. Last time I only read part of verse 7. It says, therefore, purge out the old leaven, your puffed up prideful ways, that you may be a new lump, since you're truly unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. Now, this was written to Gentiles. I, my wife and I have been to Corinth. Corinth is, is, is in Greece, by the way. <laughs> He's heard it's a Gentile place. And they seem to understand they're supposed to keep, they were keeping the days of unleavened bread because you're truly unleavened. The problem that the Corinthians had is they were not unleavened spiritually. That's why Paul continued and told them to be spiritually unleavened with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And, and interestingly, as far as Paul goes, and you don't have to go there, but Romans 3.25, Paul taught... For in his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed, which points to Passover. Okay, does that mean we should continue in sin? You don't have to go there. A few verses down in Romans uh, 3, verse 31, Paul writes, On the contrary, we establish the law. You know, most understand, who claim Christianity, that Passover predict. Uh, pictures a remembrance of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. You can read that also in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 26. But many don't seem to understand that we're not to continue in sin. Why? Part of the reason is because they don't keep the holy days and understand what they mean. Before I go any further, I've got a, a free booklet. It's available online at ccog.org. Go to www.ccog.org. Go to the literature tab. Click on the books and booklets. The covers of our literature show up with some descriptions. Just click on it. We don't ask for your email address. There's no trick. We're not asking you for money or anything like that. And you can read about each of the holy days and what they picture in terms of some of their spiritual ramifications for Christians. Sadly, instead of keeping God's holy days, people have picked other ones that uh, the Bible would not endorse. Now, in the world, sin and hypocrisy are prevalent. Likewise, in the world, leaven is all around us. By the way, it's in the air. If you keep bread out long enough, uh, leaven from the air will get into it. Mold spores, it'll, it'll be leaven. Now, not only is uh, leaven in baked goods, it's also in a lot of other products. And leaven products tend to spread because they crumble. In the Bible, leaven normally pictures malice, wickedness, and hypocrisy. I mentioned 1 Corinthians 5, 8, but uh, Jesus talked about it in Matthew 16, 6 and 16, 12, uh, also Luke uh, 12, 1. Whereas unleavened bread, as I read from 1 Corinthians 5, 8, pictures sincerity and truth. Now the Old Testament, you don't have to go there, but Deuteronomy 16, 3 says, no leaven shall be seen of, among you. So during the days of leavened bread, there should be no leaven that you can see. Again, it's still in the air, we can't re remove all of our sin. We need Christ's help. But we can do a part, at least the, the, the sins that we know or we can see. And so in the Old Testament it said, no leaven is supposed to be seen uh, among you. But in 1 John 1.7, in the New Testament, it said, 
It says his son, that's Jesus, cleanses us from all sin. So this, the parallel, the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament is here. And in 1 John 3, 4, it says sin is lawlessness, or as it said in the Old King James, the transgressor of the law. Leaven pictures the teachings of the Pharisees, according to Jesus, and Jesus called them hypocrites. That, read Matthew 16, and chapter 15 and 16, amongst other places. Now they claimed to be God's teachers and leaders. They were the educated ones and the elite of their day. But Jesus condemned them for what? Because they believed the Bible? You know, you've got some of the Protestant world to say, oh, they just believed the Bible too much because they were legalists, and so that was the problem. No. Jesus condemned them for hypocrisy and relying on traditions of men, and you read about that in Matthew 15, above God's law. Not because they were so good about keeping God's law, because they weren't. Now, I mentioned Luke before. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. I'll we'll pick this up in verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, so he trampled on one another, he, that's Jesus, began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing to be covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Now, according to uh, Strong's exhaustive concordance, the Greek word Jesus used here, translated as hypocrite, means an actor under an assumed role. The Pharisees were false religious leaders. They pretended to keep God's law, but they really did not. Um, I should also mention, we have a free booklet on the Ten Commandments at ccog.org that goes more into the Pharisees and, and the Ten Commandments. Anyway, the Pharisees were bearing false witness and they endorsed, they, they endorsed their false traditions above the Bible. And sadly, most people claim Christianity these days, they don't keep God's holy days, they keep other things, which are not biblical, even though sometimes they hope to make a little bit of biblical tie to it. But it's still, it's not the same. And now, do you have any false traditions that uh, you follow? You know, False traditions from other religions or maybe your own excuses as to why you can't change and de-leaven in certain areas? Now, let's go to Matthew 16. We'll pick this up in verse 6. I've referred to it a couple of times without quoting it. Because you see that leaven is a symbol of false doctrine and hypocrisy. Matthew 16, verse 6. And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves. This is the disciples. Ah, it's because we don't have any bread. And Jesus, you know where what they were talking about. Oh, you a little faith? Why are you reasoning among yourselves because you didn't bring any bread? Don't you remember or understand? There were five loaves. He fed 5,000. How many baskets did you pick up? How about seven loaves for the 4,000? And how many baskets did you pick up? How is it you don't understand? I don't speak about bread when I'm saying this, but beware of the leaven of Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood. He didn't tell me beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrine of Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now I want to go to uh, Matthew uh, 23. I'm going to pick this up in verse 13, but I'm going to read this from the Young's literal translation. Woe to you, scribes and theorists, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut up the reins, the reign of heaven before men. For you don't go in, nor do those who want to go in do you suffer or allow to go into. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you eat up the houses of widows for pretense, make long prayers. Because of this, you'll receive a more abundant judgment. You know, Jesus said, other places the Bible teaches, who much is given, much is required. The Pharisees should have known. Verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You can see a pattern here. Jesus keeps calling them hypocrites. Because you go around the sea and dry land make one proselyte, wherever it might happen, and you make them a, a son of Gehenna more so than yourselves. So you convert people and make them even more hypocritical than you are. Uh, as far as Gehenna, by the way, that's where uh, unrepentant sinners will uh, face the second death. You know, in verse 28 of Matthew 23, Jesus further described the Pharisees by saying, you also outwardly appear religious to men. And there's a lot of church leaders that are like that. But inside, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. 
So we see that Jesus tied leaven, the Pharisees' sinful teachings, to false religion, being hypocrites, and sin. He also tied it in to uh, uh, problems like pride. So let's go to Mark chapter 7. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. He called the multitude to himself. He said, Hear me, everyone understand. There's nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but which comes out of him. These are the things that defile a man. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. He entered the house from the way from the crowd. His disciples asked about this parable. Are you also without understanding? Do you perceive what enters a man from the outside does, cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated. Then he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For, for far from within, out of the heart, men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. And by the way, if you're watching carefully, you notice I didn't say thus purifying all foods. That is not in the original Texas Receptus. Somebody added that. So I skipped over it. Anyway, but pride puffs people up. And actually, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 3.6 specifically used the expression, puffed up with pride, when he warned about a novice becoming ordained as a church leader. And he actually warned that instead of mourning or repenting, the Corinthian Christians were wrongly puffed up in 1 Corinthians 5.2. But real love doesn't puff up. I'm going to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read verse 4. And then I'm going to go to Colossians 2 to give you a warning on that. Real love doesn't puff up. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. But leaven puffs up. Pride puffs people up. The pride of many people keep them from keeping the holy days. They, instead of the church of God, are judges on the holy days. Uh, or they're worried about their family, they're worried about their jobs, or whatever. They don't understand uh, Colossians 2, which is often mistranslated. Um, let me uh, read uh, the New King James properly translated, uh, starting verse 16. Therefore, let no one judge you in eating and drinking or in respect of a festival or the observation of the new moon or a Sabbath. For those are the shadow things to come, but the body of Christ. So it's telling us the, how, who judges you on how to keep these holy days is the body of Christ, which, by the way, implies you should be part of the body of Christ and not, not independent somehow. Uh, but this is often mistranslated, and without going into all the details on that, I actually looked at the same Greek expression that the same translators... Well, I realize that New King James had a zillion translators, but in general, every other time they had this expression, they did it differently than they translated it here. So that's why I, tra I corrected the translation. Uh, now, while I'm not a Greek scholar, I am a scholar who has studied some Greek. So, anyway, the church explains how you should keep the holy days, not that they're done away. Sadly, a lot of commentaries, particularly on the Protestant side, say that they're done away. Now, the Roman Catholics don't mind the fact that it says the church is supposed to judge because they did away with them. <laughs> okay, they, 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 if you talk to them or read, actually read some of their literature, they tell you they changed the Sabbath to Sunday. They didn't get it from the Bible. Oh, yeah, every now and then they claim some traditions, but they back out and say, look, we have the authority to do it. We did it. And, of course, we continue church guys don't agree with that. And we would point to the fact that the Roman Catholics know that early Christians kept the Sabbath on Saturday and they kept the biblical holy days. They had more proof on the biblical holy days. You can read this free book that we have. But the Protestants ignore the fact this is but the body of Christ. So they're just like, oh, it was, uh, it's telling us something else. It's just telling us the holy days are a shadow, but we need to focus on Christ. That's typically how they explain it, as opposed to, no, don't let outsiders judge you how, how you keep this. So... Uh, somebody who's not a Christian may say, oh, this is ridiculous that you don't uh, eat leaven right now. Look, we got this wedding coming on. This is wedding cake. You have to eat it. If you don't do it, you know, you think, oh, they're going to judge me bad. No, we don't care, okay? <laughs> you should be judged by the body of Christ which says during the day of leavened bread, you don't eat leavened bread. 
Anyway, if you're properly keeping the days of leaven bread, in time you come to realize that cleaning out all the leaven out of carpets, etc., you can't really do. Now, God does not expect you to pull all the carpets out of your house and burn them. It just says eleven, no leaven should be seen among you. Okay? So which means, by the way, doesn't mean that you should actually look. It doesn't mean, okay, I don't want to see anything. Okay, I, I don't say, oh, this is good, there's no leaven. And you, you run a bakery, and it's, all, it's all full of everything. <laughs> that's, how, that's not what this is saying. But uh, there is, uh, now where I'm at right now, there is no carpet. But in, in cars and in uh, homes, particularly in Western societies, there's carpet. And I'm sure there's some kind of leaven down there, in there someplace. And we vacuum and we revacuum, but it's still going to be there. But that helps teach us that no matter how hard we try, we need Christ's help to remove all sin from us. But we should work on the sins we can see. You know, many of your sins you can see, therefore you should confess them and change. And there's some that are really down deep. And you don't have to go there, but John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, and you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Okay? For without me you can do nothing. Okay? You can be laid the sin, which Jesus condemned their work. But to actually be purged of all your sins, you need Christ's help. We did a short video once about how to change your life in five seconds. And I'll make this really simple. James wrote, uh, uh, Submit yourself to God and resist the devil, he will flee. So it takes less than five seconds. Jesus, please help me. Okay, I, I didn't try to time that, but I don't think that was five seconds. If you remember that and you repeat it, you know, a lot of times people worry about things. You read Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about, you know, Gentiles worry about what they eat, drink, wear, and all that. Don't, don't worry about that. Seek first the kingdom of God and you get what you want. But he also says, let the day be sufficient for itself. Because we're like, hey, I, can't, I can't hold on another five years, three years, two years, 20 years, whatever it may be. Uh, Jesus says, take it one a day at a time. You say, well, even a day is a long time. Okay, then take it a minute at a time. It's too much. Okay, five seconds at a time. Eventually you get to the point, you can, you can do it. Now, as far as leaven goes, you know, We've gone more depth than other messages on it, but physically, leavening agents include things like uh, 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 baker's yeast, bicarbonate soda, baking soda, and baking powder. And physically, leavening agents puff up grain containing products and make them look larger than they would be otherwise. And people often want to look more influential or more spiritual than they really are. I'm going to go to Micah 6, verse 8. to tell you what God really wants. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And lately, by the way, I've been blasted because I love mercy apparently too much and people think I'm too merciful, I guess. Um, I don't know if God thinks I am, but this is what it says in Micah 6, verse 8. Now, Satan's problem, by the way, is he refused to walk humbly. He was the anointed cherub, Ezekiel 28, 14. He had it all. He blew uh, the father of the word. He was it. He was, he, was, he, was next, he was up there. But like him, humans often let their pride get in the way. Pride puffs people up, as I mentioned before. And most don't do what God says because their pride in human reasoning. And Satan influences both of those. As far as pride goes, let's go to Proverbs chapter 16. Starting verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts God, happy is he. I don't know if I've got this in my notes or not, but I like to quote uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart, lean out your understanding, all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. But the next verse says, don't be wise in your own eyes. So what happens is people don't trust God because they're wise in their own eyes. Ah. Let's, let's just say, let me 
keep something here. I wasn't planning on this. Okay, these are two pens, just for sake of argument. If you take all the human beings that ever lived and all the knowledge they have together, they know less than God does, of course, but specifically, God knows more about the differences between these two pretty similar black pens than all human knowledge combined. That is how much smarter, how wiser God is compared to us. There is no comparison. You say, oh, I agree with that. Yeah, but when it comes down to it, well, I think God doesn't really get it. Okay, you know, I'm in the flesh right now, I'm going through this. Maybe God doesn't really get it. Now, actually, one of the reasons he said Jesus is to prove to you that he knew how to, that God understands. But, but we just reason around it and think, oh, God can't possibly understand everything that we're going through. I'll make it even more. God knows more about the differences between any two cells in your body than all human beings ever know altogether. As a, as a person with a, a doctorate in one of the biological fields, first I'll tell you that uh, uh, Charles Darwin said that uh, if, the, if the cell was more complicated than he thought, it blew his whole theory away. It's so much more complicated than he thought. <laughs> And we still don't, we're just barely scratching the surface of some of it. And so, anyway, God knows more about you than you possibly can imagine, as well as what you will do in his kingdom if you will submit to him. You know, do you really trust God and not yourself? We all trust ourselves too much. And I'm not an exception, by the way. You know, but uh, Philippians 4, 13 says, You can do all things by Christ Jesus who strengthens you. Obadiah warns, back in the Old Testament, third verse, the pride of your heart has deceived you. It's deceived all of us. That's why all of, you know, all of sin and fallen fall short of the glory of God. In Proverbs, uh, let's go to Proverbs 15. I'm going to do this backwards the way I have it in my notes. I'm going to do it in order, order numeric sequence. Proverbs 55, 33, 15, Excuse me. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty. Oh, I can do it all. I'm got it all. I'm young, I'm strong, I'm pretty, I'm whatever. Before honor is humility. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride will bring him low. Because people will do things they shouldn't do. But the humble in spirit will retain honor. God wants you to forsake pride, accept his teachings, be humble, then he'll grant honor. And many don't really have the faith to humble themselves. And I'm going to read, you don't have to go there, but I'm going to read uh, Luke uh, 18, verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Well, you've got Christians, you've got a bunch of different types of Christians. You have actually real Christians and others. We'll, we'll forget the others right now, people who profess Christ who aren't really Christians. If they don't have uh, God's Spirit, they're not Christians. So let's talk about those who do have God's Spirit. Most end-time Christians are later to see him. Why do you think Jesus said when he comes... Will he really find faith on the earth? Because most people who are actually Christians don't really have the faith that they need to have to do what they should do. A lot of people choose the Church of God based on the minister they like, or how close they can go, drive to go to services, or because some of their relatives went there, or whatever it is. That's not the criteria. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith in the earth? This is not something that I invented. Okay, Jesus said it thousands, uh, almost 2,000 years ago. You know, many people claim to believe in Jesus, but are unwilling to truly humble themselves before God. Such humility takes faith. Faith that there really is a God, and we have booklets on that you can prove, is God's existence logical. I suggest you read it. It's also free at ccog.org to prove that there is a God. We also have another one called Proof Jesus is the Messiah. Once you know that there is a God, and once you can prove that without a doubt, by the way, just believing in God is interesting. The demons believe and they tremble, but they don't obey. Once you prove that Jesus is the Son of God, and God's Word is His Word, then you should do something about it, and not, oh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it really isn't an afterlife. Maybe, you know, maybe this stuff isn't real. 
If you believe that, uh, you're unstable, uh, you're not, uh, you're double-minded, and James says you're unstable in all your ways, you should be able to prove that there's a God. And Jesus said, if you've done this, do what you're supposed to do. He tells the Laodiceans, I wish you were hot or cold. Hot means you're doing what you're supposed to do. Cold means you're out of it completely. He says, but you're lukewarm. So I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Most people have their excuses or reasons or their pride getting away from what they should be doing. And otherwise, Jesus would have no reason to blast the Laodiceans the way he does or to say, when he comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now anyway, Exodus 12, 15, you don't have to go there. It says, on the first day, you remove leaven from your houses. And so those who attempt to obey God uh, remove things uh, for their houses, clean out their toasters, and otherwise get rid of leaven. Actually, we got rid of our toaster a few years ago. We don't have one anymore for a couple of reasons. One, I, I would buy the cheapest toasters. They used to cost about six bucks, and I'd just throw it away. Because the amount of labor that I took to work out of cleaning a toaster, you could never, I could never get all the leaven out. And I realized it was way simpler for me to spend six dollars and buy a new one. But also, in time, I started to read that, you know, I used to toast my sandwiches every day that I eat and for my lunch. And then I kept reading, well, it does affect B vitamins. And so now I don't toast at all, so I don't have a toaster. So it doesn't mean I don't like things toasted occasionally, but I don't have toaster anymore. Uh, but anyway, but we remove these things before the beginning of the days of leavened bread each year. Most people who claim to be Christians don't have the humility to do it. And, uh, and many just put pride get in the way of removing sins. We're always supposed to be examining themselves. You know, the, since the physical removing of leaven involves work. And the term for day in Exodus 12:15 uh, is, uh, I'm going to spell this, M-I-Y-O-W-M. And it's, uh, it's uh, different than the normal word for, for day, which is U-W-B-A-Y-O-W-N, uh, in Exodus 12:16. This, by the way, supports the position that you're supposed to have all the leaven removed prior to the start of the first day of the leaven bread. And that's consistent with other scriptures that says, for seven days there'll be no leaven, leaven found in your house. So if you started cleaning on the first day of leaven bread, then you've already violated seven days, there couldn't be any there. All right. I'm going to read something from the old Ambassador College of uh, Bible Correspondence course. It says, all leaven and leaven food should be removed from one's premises before the beginning of the first holy day. You're not supposed to store them in another room. Uh, so the morning after uh, the Passover... It's a convenient time to finish removing all that. And we did that ourselves. We got rid of everything uh, uh, before sunset last night. And removing these products is one way God tests us to see how much we value our obedience to him. And by the way, we don't give leaven to somebody else so they give it back to us later. Okay? Uh, you, you don't really hoist your sins on somebody else and then ask to get them back. And by the way, there's all kinds of ways to make up unleavened bread. It's actually pretty easy to do. I've, I did it recently. Uh, just whopping three ingredients, flour, butter, and water. <laughs> okay. But there's all kinds of flat breads, including uh, corn tortillas that uh, are a type of unleavened bread. And if you're in a culture without bread, you can still probably crush and dry something and make something that sort of looks like bread. Now, I, I mentioned the uh, old uh, Worldwide Church of God, and they put some stuff out about... Uh, this uh, about how leaven pictures sin back in the Good News magazine in March of 1984 it says uh, when you consider the nature of leaven and unleavened bread you can see several spiritual uh, comparisons with sin and righteousness they wrote living in sin is easy being righteous is hard well perhaps in the short run um, uh, Living in sin tends to cause various issues. Uh, where our office is, there are people who walk by here during the day a lot who I can tell their minds have been blown by drugs. Uh, so it may have been easy to start it, but uh, there are consequences. Anyway, this article says, because of its soft texture, leavened bread is easier to eat than unleavened bread. And it says, likewise, uh, living the way of sin is easier than living righteously. So God's way is difficult even for a Christian because you have a carnal nature that wants to sin, Romans 7. Sin exalts itself, righteousness builds humility. Leaven puffs bread up, uh, the same is true of sin, it puffs up the sinner. 
the sinner's desire is to exalt himself instead of allowing God to rule over him. Governance is the issue. Okay, you either accept God as your Lord and Master, or you don't. Um, a lot of people have all these exceptions. Oh, I, I would, I would, if, if God himself actually told me, I would listen, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and uh, the Pharisees t- types that said that, Jesus said, yeah, you, you, you say if you were around during times of prophets, you would listen. You wouldn't. Okay? People always have excuses. Okay, here's one. Uh, sin's pleasures are temporary. That's true. The benefits of righteousness endure. Leavened bread left out soon becomes hard and moldy. Unleavened bread lasts actually longer. Spiritually, the pleasures of sin soon pass away. Let's talk about Job chapter 20, by the way. And the end result is eternal death, Romans 6.23. Righteousness, in contrast, brings both temporal and eternal blessings. Sin spreads evil easily. Righteousness, that's built slowly. It doesn't take long for leaven to spread through a loaf of bread, by the way, if you're trying to make it. And that's the way sin is. It spreads rapidly. Whereas building righteous character takes a lifetime. Sin's based on deceit. Truth is based is the basis for righteousness. What you see is not what you get with loaf of, un, of leavened bread. Air pockets give the impression there's more to the loaf than is really there. Sin also appears to be something that's not. Deceiving the sinner into thinking he or she is getting something worthwhile while they're only earning the death penalty from it. With righteousness, there's no uh, deceit, only truth. And they cited Psalm 119, verses 151 172. Here's one. This probably will not come as a surprise to those of you watching this. Sin is more prevalent than righteousness. Most people prefer leavened bread because they find its taste more desirable. Is it really better? Not necessarily, just more common. People are accustomed to it. Spiritually, the same is true. Most people prefer to live in sin, or I'll add to this, or are comfortable with traditions that are not biblical. Okay? Look, I used to keep uh, Easter and Halloween and Christmas and those kind of things. I didn't feel bad about it at all. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I didn't know much about the Bible when I was a kid. Uh, we actually didn't have a Bible until I was... Actually, I was probably about 13 when we actually got a Bible. I don't know if I bought it or how we got one. Somebody must have given it. Somebody gave my brother, one of my, my youngest brother, New Testament. I know that. And I started to read that. So I had no idea if the Bible talked about Holy Days or Holiday. I grew up Roman Catholic. I went to catechism, went to Catholic church, school, you know. So some of these things I just, 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 just didn't know. All right. Let's see what else I want to say about here. Oh, sin builds a false image. Righteousness builds true character. Leavened bread gives a false impression. Uh, so, the, so does the sinner. They try to be impressed on the outside. True character is based more on the inward appearance. Uh, uh, this article continues, what God's showing us through the analogy of leaven and sin, particularly this time, is clear. He wants you to escape the clutches of sin and lead a righteous life. But how can you eliminate sin and grow in righteousness? Following the three R's, which are not the American joke, reading, writing, arithmetic, it's recognize, resist, and repent. Recognize sin. Most people overlook what the Bible says. Uh, John, 1 John 3, verse 4, Old King James, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Discerning sin is a matter of understanding and applying God's law. At the basis of God's law are the Ten Commandments. And do you know if you don't know what they are, how are you going to overcome sin? Uh, and we have our booklet on the Ten Commandments gives you some practical information about them. Not just what, the, what they are, but information about why you should keep them and some of the benefits, etc. But beyond the basic commandments, God requires obedience to biblical principles in order to conduct your life. Uh, the underlying principle of the law, which is love, is still binding. You're supposed to examine yourselves, it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And the question is, are you really putting God first in everything? If not, you're violating the first commandment. We've got a sermon on the first commandment because that's the one that people will break the most. By the way, we also have one on the second commandment, third commandment, fourth commandment, and we cover the other commandments in various ones. But most people do not put God first. They think they're keeping the first commandment when they're not. Can you admit when you're wrong? If you can't, you've got to, then uh, you've not repented properly as a, as a Christian. 
We're supposed to uh, resist temptation and resist sin. I mentioned James before, but uh, it would be James 1, verses 13 to 15. This uh, uh, does involve things like self-control. Right now we're in a society that thinks that uh, they can do anything, any perverted thing they want, redefine things that are uh, unredefinable, because that's how they feel. Now, they don't have proper self-control. Now that being said, even if you're trying, sometimes it's very difficult. We've got a bad, we don't want to get battle weary. You know, we've got we have personal problems, we have injustices in society, neighbors, etc. It's easy to think you've done all you can, but don't be fooled. You can you can do more. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, even though it feels like it, it's more than you can handle. And you say, well, that doesn't affect you. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it might be multiple times in a day. But Jesus said, he or she who endures the end, the same will be saved. So we just work through it. Confess our sins, and he is faithful and just, forgives our sins, and cleanses from all unrighteousness. Anyway, in the Bible, sometimes we see the number seven picture a symbol of completion. And in the days of blood and bread, there are seven. To where we strive to earnestly remove sin from our lives completely. And the third R was repent of sin. When you recognize sin, resist it, you should still, sometimes you fall into it. What do you do? Strive not to sin. Seek God's forgiveness. Upon real repentance, abandoning the wrong way and living the right way, God promised to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Some would say, don't try so hard. Just rely on grace. What does God say? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, who died in sin, live any longer in it? That was uh, Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. And I'll also mention that in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 32, the apostles, including Peter, said, God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And in Hebrews 5, 9, the apostle Paul wrote that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation for those who obey him. A lot of people... Don't think they have to obey him or think that they can work around it. The Pharisees, by the way, thought that they could work around it. They thought, no, we read the law. We're really smart. We're the educated ones. Jesus said they never understood the law. Or they didn't act like they did. They wanted to act pi piously before everybody, but inside they were thieves and liars and adulterers, spiritually anyway. So anyway... Do we overcome all our sins all at once? No, absolutely not. Some are so deep and habitual, we don't even see them. And many take years or even decades to overcome, if, if then. Ask yourself, are you sinning as often as you did? Because if not, then sin's going to have less and less control over you. Every time you sin, sin kind of takes control over you to a degree. The less you do, the easier it is to resist. Today the world is in misery because of sin and they also reject the festival of unleavened bread, most of them. And hopefully that you're, you're going to uh, keep them. Now let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 starting in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 10 starting in verse 12. Understand that truly, tr truly relying on God can teach you past sin, but relying on yourself is dangerous. And this is why I wanted to quote this passage. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, it doesn't always feel that way. But if you have faith in God, understand that God will, allow, will pull you through, even though you don't think he can. He can. And also, don't use the excuse you've tried and failed. I'm going to read uh, Zechariah 4, 6. You don't have to go there. But so this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And while I tend to apply that to the end time work of the church, it also is your, your part of the end time work of the church. God is working through you and in you so you can be able to give love in a unique way based on all the suffering and stuff that you've gone through to make eternity better for yourself and everyone else. I see the, uh, in my notes, I finally quoted something I already said before. Philippians 4.13. 
Remember, Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So don't give up. Now the days of living bread are an annual reminder. If people were perfect after baptism or Passover, perhaps God wouldn't have had the days of leavened bread. But we're not perfect. Um, let's go to 1 John chapter 1. I kind of ran through this a couple of times, but we'll go through it again. Starting in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Now think about that in the context of leaven and unleavened bread. Okay? Paul talked about unleavened being sincere in truth and leaven being sin and puffing us up. Now it's deceiving ourselves. Remember, leavened bread looks bigger than it is. If you had never had, seen any leavened bread in your whole life and you were used to bread that would say about the size of this mouse, okay? Okay? Uh, okay. Wow, that's probably enough for uh, breakfast or lunch anyway. Okay, unless you really want to eat a lot. Maybe it wouldn't be for your lunch. I don't eat a lot for lunch, so it would be enough. Or maybe a couple, twice as big. But then you see this puffed up piece this big. Oh, wow, that's going to take you a lot of time. You, then you start to eat it. Wait, this didn't fill me up at all. Cause, but we're so familiar with leaven that we expect when we see something that we, we, we've got an idea now. But if you didn't, you wouldn't know. And that actually reminds me of something I heard in a sermon once about Satan. Satan is not much of an original thinker because he found out what works every single generation. You've got young people who, uh, if they start going through puberty, feel certain ways, think that uh, what they're facing, nobody else faced before, so they make the same, Satan hasn't made the same mistakes generation after generation after generation. I'm not going into all the details of what all those mistakes would be, but they are they just think, ah, we know more than our parents, or we know how we feel, and you know, Satan knows how you feel, too, in that respect. Anyway, part I quoted before was verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. So this is another reason why we need to keep the days of love and bread, because we do have sin, and we need to repent of it. Next chapter, verse 1, chapter 2. First John. My little children, these things I write to you that you so you may not sin. I'm not writing this to say you can just make an excuse. Oh, it's okay that I uh, sin because John said I was going to sin, so it's okay and it's fine for me to be a sinner because I'm just a sinner and it's not my fault. Therefore, I'm a sinner and it's okay. No! He said, I wrote you so you don't do this. And if you do sin, you have an advocate father with the Father of Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's perpetuation of payment for our sins. Not for ours only, but for the whole world. Now, by the way, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he who says, I know him, doesn't keep his commandments. He's a liar. The truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word, and by the way, that means all of his word. You get people who say they claim the Bible, but they only read a couple of parts, say the law is done away or something like that. He keeps his word. Jesus is called the word. We've got this book called the Bible, the word of God. So it's more than just one or two words here. Whoever keeps his word, the love of God is perfected in him. By this will know we're in him. He who say he abides in him ought himself ought to walk just as Jesus walked. And do you think Jesus was keeping those days? No, he was not keeping those days. He was keeping the biblical holy days. So the apostles and all the rest. Sin is serious. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we're not supposed to continue in sin. Uh, for that, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, you can read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 23. We're not supposed to tolerate sin. And by the way, when we keep the days of love and bread, we're not supposed to keep them haphazardly. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. In Proverbs 10, 4, it says, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of diligent makes rich. And just has physical and spiritual applications. You're not supposed to be slack in obeying God. You're not supposed to say, okay, what's the minimum I can get away with? You know what? You know, what do I really have to do? Matter of fact, I talked to somebody once who had left the Church of God. He talked to somebody else left the Church of God, but he didn't want to totally leave the Church of God. So basically this person told him, well, here's what you do. You, you sin and do all kinds of sins. I won't go to all the sins of work. But twice a year, fast on the Day of Atonement, 
and uh, show up at Passover. Now you're not supposed to do Passover, you haven't examined yourself, but this is what this person told me he was advised by somebody. And then he finally realized that that was wrong for various reasons. It took him years, I think, quite a few years before he figured that out. Anyway, in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Be diligent to present yourself as proof to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we're not supposed to see, okay, how far can we go? How, how much towards sin can we go? That's not what we're we're supposed to do. In, I'm not going to read all of it. In Deuteronomy uh, uh, 30, starting verse 15, it's recorded as, See, I've said before you, life and death, life and good, death and evil. I command you to love the Lord your God, walk in His ways and His statutes. Okay? You have a choice. You do it right or do it wrong. And Deuteronomy 30 taught, says you're going to get blessed if you do the right thing. But Jesus and John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're supposed to live God's way, not, which is the way of life, not the way of death. And in John 6, uh, starting verse 48, Jesus talked about being the bread of life, and he talks about the living bread that came down from heaven, and he mentioned manna that the children of Israel had, and by the way, the manna was unleavened. Now, I was going to go over a little bit about church history. Because you may be in a church or been in a church that didn't keep the Days of Love and Bread. And so I'm going to read something from a, a book called uh, History of the Church to 8325 by, a, I think it's a Dr. Gorham. Uh, it was written in 1905. It said, to the first Christians, the yearly recurrence of Passover, thought his Passover was supposed to be yearly. You don't uh, take Passover symbols every day, every week, every quarter. Various churches do those ways. Must have brought vivid memories all that happened on the Passover uh, when uh, Jesus was killed. Okay, and that's true. Uh, Christ our Passover sacrifice for us, wrote St. Paul. Okay, and that's true. And this became, by the way, the chief and only reason to observe the Feast of Eleven Bread. Ah, because early Christians were doing that. Okay. Now, there's a very old document that was probably altered in the 4th century. Uh, it's called The Life of Polycarp. And it's talking about certain things, and we, this is not scripture, but it talks about that in the days of unleavened bread, Paul came down from Galatia, and he went to Asia Minor, to meet with the faithful in Smyrna. Smyrna is in Asia Minor, the area now known as Turkey. It's uh, somewhat near the coast. My wife and I have been there a couple of times. And so it says, Paul in Smyrna visited uh, uh, a relative of Timothy's, and he uh, talked to them also concerning Passover and Pentecost, and that they uh, celebrate the, the, the days of leavened bread, but to understand about Jesus, his, his death, and his resurrection. And from, for here, the apostle plainly teaches we ought to keep it not outside the days of unleavened bread like the heretics do. But he named the days of unleavened bread the Passover and Pentecost, thus ratifying the gospel. So according to this writing, Paul went and told people they have to keep those holy days. And by the way, you can find uh, references to uh, the holy days in Paul's writings anyway. But this is saying that this, he went down there and he did this. And Polycarp kept the days of unleavened bread. And uh, it was believed that uh, uh, Polycarp was actually uh, killed uh, during the Days of Eleven Bread. The first day of Eleven Bread, probably. We're not sure, but it's possible. And uh, here's another writing that says, says it. Um, this is from J.B. Lightfoot, who was a famous Anglican bishop, uh, and he wrote in the 1800s. It says... Uh, Talking about this other scholar called Hilgenfeld adopts the day given in the Pascal Chronicle. So Polycarp must have been must have suffered on the 15th of Nisan, the first day of unleavened bread. Uh, and so they also have a date that perhaps he was killed therefore in 60, 169 A.D. because that was first day of unleavened bread uh, there. And so I mention this because the Roman Catholics actually have a feast day for Polycarp, and it's in February, and their dates are wrong. 
because he was killed, looks like, the first day of the bread of the unleavened bread. And also, we also think it's possible that uh, Peonius uh, was uh, killed on the day, during the days of unleavened bread as well. As far as the days of unleavened bread, I want to quote from a, one a bishop or overseer called Polycrates of Ephesus. What happened was, in the late 2nd century, there was a Roman bishop by the name of uh, Victor, and he was telling people in Rome that they needed to keep Passover on a Sunday. And there were people over in Rome who didn't agree. So according to some Catholic scholars, by the way, some Catholic scholars don't pay attention to this, but some modern Catholic scholars say this is what happened, that the people who were keeping Passover on the right day wrote to Asia Minor because Rome was not considered to be in charge of everything at the time. Asia Minor was because Polycarp had been there. Actually, the last apostle who died, John, died in Asia Minor, followed by Polycarp, who was the one man that God had uh, rule for about 50 years or in charge of the church. And there's a whole succession. As a matter of fact, in this letter to Polycrates, he lays this stuff out about Passover because he heard that Victor wanted everybody to keep Passover on the wrong day, on Sunday. So Polycrates wrote, We observe the exact day, neither adding or taking away. For in Asia Minor, great lights have fallen asleep, and they're going to rise in the day of the Lord's coming. Among these are Philip, one of the twelve apostles, his two aged daughters, another daughter who uh, died in, who in Ephesus. Moreover, John the, was a witness and a teacher. He reclined in Jesus' bosom, and he uh, di died in Ephesus, or fell asleep, the term they use. Then there was Polycarp of Smyrna. He was a bishop and martyr. Then there was Thracius, a bishop and martyr from Eumania, who, di who died in Smyrna. And let's mention Sigaris, who was a bishop and martyr. And he fell asleep in Laodicea. Or the blessed uh, Papyrus or Melito, the eunuch, who lived all together in the Holy Spirit, lays in uh, Sardis, when he rises from the dead. All these observed the 14th day of the Passover, according to the Gospel, deviating in no respect following the rule of faith. I also, Polycrates, at least among you, do according to the tradition of my relatives. So, oh, you just mentioned a tradition. It's a biblical tradition, a true tradition, not a false tradition. Which I've, my seven, my relatives are bishops, I'm the eighth. We've always observed the day when the people put away the leaven. Oh, you mean you got rid of the leaven? Therefore, I have lived 65 years of the Lord. I met brethren around the world. I've gone through every holy scripture, which, by the way, means, Plickery said he had the whole Bible. Okay, we need the Church of God believes that the true church had it from the beginning. We have a book called Who Gave the World the Bible? So-called scholars these days discount all that and say it took hundreds of years or whatever to come up with it. No, he said he went through every scripture. He was a Church of God leader. I'm not frightened by terrifying words, he said. For those greater than I said, we must meet. He said, we've got to obey God rather than men. So he said, look, we observe the stuff putting away the leaven, and we keep the right day. And uh, interestingly, the uh, 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 old uh, Worldwide Church of God uh, said that uh, he was a church leader, and he was part of the, quote, Catholic Church of God. And I know that's a term I've used occasionally. Some people raise their eyebrows about it. Because the term Catholic was first used for the Church of God in Smyrna. The first two times it was used was was there. And uh, the uh, uh, the original Catholic Church, if you want to use that term, had continuing Church of God doctrine. And we have a free book on that, at least the original Catholic Church. You can find it at ccg.org. And if you're a Roman or uh, Eastern Orthodox Catholic, I want to let you know that in that book, we quote people your churches say are saints. We also quote from your acceptable, your accepted translations of the Bible into uh, English. I have the East, Eastern Orthodox Bible, actually it's right over there, I've got a copy of it there, and I've got uh, other Bibles of different ones, and we, we, quote, we quote those ones. <laughs> anyway, it's interesting, something else, a, a Protestant scholar from the, uh, in 1857, uh, Johann Karl uh, Ludwig Geisler said, the church is in Asia Minor. They kept the Passover on the 14th, and they kept... Uh, the days of unleavened bread, like the Jews. There is no trace of a yearly festival of the resurrection among them. The Christians of Asia Minor appealed in, faithful, in favor of the Passover on the 14th. 
And they said the Apostle John did it that way. By the way, the Roman Catholics, by the way, if you look through their stuff, including the guy they call the Venerable Bede, they tell you the Apostle John actually kept Passover on the 14th. Not on Sunday. For some reason, they said, well, but maybe Peter kept it on a different day. Peter and John traveled together. You can read in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5 I mentioned before. They were together. You think they're keeping Passover on two different days. They were with Jesus at the last Passover. Do you think they wouldn't know when it was? There was no distinction between the apostles and what day Passover was. All right, having said that, in the third century, uh, we also find uh, references in something called the, uh, the Epistula Apostolorum that said uh, that talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so these were, it was still there. Well, this is hundreds of years after Jesus was resurrected. The early Christians would say, oh, they were done away. Okay, the Holy Days were done away because Jesus came, he fulfilled them. And they were a shadow of something, we don't really know what. Maybe we can pretend we know, but we don't really know because we're not going to keep them. And we don't care. No, early Christians kept them. In the book of Jude, verse 3, Jude tells Christians to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Excuse me, once for all means the one they were keeping. Now, I've run into Protestant types who say, oh, wow, well, my scholar says this means this or this means that. And I say, who cares? <gasps> who knew Koine Greek, the language that Jesus had the uh, New Testament recorded in, better than the people who lived in the first century? Nobody. And the people in the second century would have been the next best in the third century. They used the ones, actually, this was their language, and they knew the people who knew Jesus. But then who knew them, etc. Polycrates gave us a list that covered uh, 100, uh, depending on how you want to count it, uh, 150 years, plus or minus. Uh, maybe 100, yeah, about 150 years. And they all kept Passover on, the, on that day. And um, interestingly, origin of Alexandria, uh, who the uh, late... Uh, Pope Benedict XVI said was a great scholar. He says there's all kinds of things to learn from uh, the days of leavened bread, but he didn't think he needed to keep them. Okay? I grew up Roman Catholic. I never heard of them. Maybe they were mentioned, but I don't remember anything about them. But I can assure you that our children growing up knew about the days of leavened bread. Okay? Because we could get rid of leaven. We made them eat unleavened bread each of the seven days, etc. So they do. Now, sadly... In the middle of the third century, one of the uh, pupils of Origen, a guy by the name of uh, Gregory Thaumaturgus, he wrote against biblical days in favor of the unbiblical ones. He came up with, he says, uh, talked about the festival, the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary. Uh, says, yeah, old Israel, they kept their festival, but it was the unleavened bread. And he says, uh, now I'm going to, God's can turn those festivals into shame. So he was, he was opposed to it. And by the way, a lot of false doctrines came in partially because of this Gregory guy uh, because he had the power, according to some writings, if he threw his cloak over, he could kill you, and he had the power to summon demons. So he was a great demonic force, and he got his doctrine put in there. Now, but not all, by the way, the Greco-Romans went along with this. In the late 3rd century, there was a Greco-Roman by the name of uh, Anatolius of Alexandria. And when he was bishop of Laodicea, he wrote, The festival of the Passover of Bread ought by all means to be kept after the equinox. But nothing was difficult for them to be, when it was, who was, awful, it was lawful to celebrate Passover on any day when the 14th of the month happened to come. And the evangelist John, who, let, who leaned on the Lord's breast, did the same thing. Okay? They knew. This is the late 3rd century. Okay? So over 200 years after Jesus, they knew they were supposed to be keeping these days and they knew when they were supposed to be. And what's believed to have been the first creed used by a church in Constantinople was a renunciation of the Nazarene Christians, the faithful Christians. And one of the things they had to renunciate was keeping the biblical holy days says, specifically, you were supposed to say, I renounce all customs, rights, legalisms, unleavened breads, and sacrifices of the Lamb of Hebrews, all other fish, the Hebrew sacrifices, etc. 
uh, Sabbaths, hymns, food and drink. I renounce everything. And said I, uh, to take their new religion. Now, this would have been the 4th, 5th, 6th century. Why did they have them renounce it? Because they were still keeping it. There were always people keeping God's holy days throughout history. Uh, we go into some of that in this booklet that I've held up a few times. But that didn't stop them all, by the way. So there was canon number 37 and 38 of the Council of Nicaea from 363 to 364. And it says, it's not lawful to uh, receive portions sent for the feast of the Jews. And it's not lawful to receive unleavened bread, nor be partakers of it. Which makes no sense. The other reason it makes no sense, I mentioned before, growing up Roman Catholic, that Easter is supposed to be Passover. Now, if you look at the, what the Roman Catholics tell you, as a historian, scholar type stuff, basically what they say in plain English is a lot of their people endorse Passover and Pentecost. And therefore, we're supposed to keep them until we're their Easter and their version of Pentecost. But they just keep all these condemnations and all the days are thrown together. Well, Passover and Pentecost are still God's days too. So they kind of, one hand, tell you, we condemn everybody for keeping any one of them any way, shape, or form. And the other hand, well, we keep a couple of them. And the other ones, you know, they do have a meaning, we just don't do it. So uh, I, we've got an article at the cogwriter.com website about keeping those, about the first day of 11 bread for Christians. And I've got a lot more stuff in here about some scholar stuff from the 4th century that's been translated. You can see that there must have been a reason that they were condemned. They wouldn't condemn if it didn't exist. Now, in the uh, late 4th century, early 5th century, Augustine, or Augustine, or Hippo, claimed, well, with regard to unleavened bread and such things, which the Apostle said were a shadow of future things, uh, it, we've now learned basically what was to be revealed. So it's foolish in us, after the light of the New Testament, to think that these predictive observances could be of any use to us. So Augustine is saying they're no use to us because they had a predictive value. Predictive of what? Okay? Um, Jesus was our Passover lamb. Okay, we'll grant that one. Jesus was without sin, so I suppose in that respect, somewhat had to do with, uh, in that respect, unleavened bread. But what about us and our part? Okay? Was it just that did the Jews, the children of Israel, were they told to keep the days of unleavened bread only so they would know that Jesus was sin free? I don't think so. I think it was also to look at themselves. And that's what we're supposed to do. And the Apostle Paul made it clear we're supposed to examine ourselves, said it over in a couple different places. If you have examined yourself, you're in the faith. You don't eat the bread and drink the cup unworthily. And by the way, this I told her 4th, 5th century here, around the same time, both a guy, a historian named Epiphanes and Jerome, wrote that there were these Nazarene Christians. And they kept these kind of Jewish ways. They kept the Sabbath, they did unclean meats, they kept the Bible holy days. And now, despite the fact that many later decided to observe something called Lent, which is not from the Bible, the faithful continued to keep the Days of Eleven Bread throughout history. There's a Seventh-day Adventist uh, researcher by the name of uh, Daniel uh, Lighty, or Lady, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, or maybe it's Le Leaky, Leaky. He reported that the Sabbath keepers in Transylvania in the 1500s kept the biblical holy days. And he wrote, the Sabbatarians viewed themselves as converted Gentiles, which is what I consider myself. They held to the biblical holidays. Passover, they celebrated with unleavened bread. The first and last day of Passover were full holidays. That, in other words, they were God's holy days. That's the first and last day of unleavened bread. And we've got other reports about these people. Uh, here's from somebody who's, uh, I don't think was a Sabbath keeper. Her name was uh, Judith, Judith Gerlard, who wrote about these people from 1638. So they called them Judaizers because they, uh, they uh, observed the Sabbath. They farmed on Sundays. They didn't eat pork or blood. They celebrated Passover with unleavened bread. They refused baptism of children. 
Okay? And these were people of the Church of God doctrine. Now, in the 1600s, there was a Sabbath keeper in the British Isles by the name of John Tasky, Trasky. And he wrote, The 14th of the March moon to coincide with Jewish Passover should be followed by the eating of unleavened bread seven days. Now, before I go further, what's interesting about him, and I didn't know about him until I'd written a bunch of stuff looking at all this old stuff about proof that early Christians kept the holy days, is a Roman Catholic priest wrote against this guy in the 1600s and says, He's quoting like people like Polycarp and stuff and said that they kept Passover in the 14th and therefore we should. How dare he do that? It's like, excuse me, guys. You guys say pass the Polycarp and Melito and some of these other uh, people I mentioned, Segaris and Thracis, uh, were all saints and they all kept Passover in the 14th and you know it. You're supposed to contend earnestly with the faith once for all delivered saints not supposed to change. Now in the 20th century, the old radio church of God said, to observe Passover alone and fail to observe the seventh day unleavened bread, seven days unleavened bread, means in symbolism they accept Christ's blood and then continue in sin. Christians have kept the days of unleavened bread throughout the church age, and the continuing church of God we still do to today. Even though these days are first mentioned in the Old Testament, it's the New Testament we learn more fully how leaven pictures the false religion of sin and hypocrisy. And the New Testament shows the connection between Jesus' sacrifice, Passover, and removal of sin from our lives. Eleven, according to Jesus, is a symbol of sin and hypocrisy, and we're not supposed to tolerate it. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Starting in verse 7, Paul wrote, Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So if you say, well, you know, I'll keep some of the holy day. Well, maybe I'll kind of partially keep the Sabbath, except if I have to work. Or maybe I'll kind of partially keep some of the holy days. But no, I've got to take off work to go keep the days of leaven. Bread, well, you don't have to do that. So, well, yeah, our office, for example, is closed today. It's a visit, normal, it would have been a normal business day because the day of bread, we closed. We could have said, oh, we're not going to do that because, you know, that's inconvenient. No, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You go start go, go down the path and sin, it gets worse and worse and worse, you get farther and farther from God. So again, we see Paul talking about leaven again. And during the day of leavened bread, we have a physical reminder. We've got the leaven out of our lives, and we eat a piece of unleavened bread, which reminds us that we're in the days of leavened bread, and to focus on this. Uh, and let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I was debating if I should do this, but I'm going to pick it up. Verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking who may desire, devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So Peter's saying, it's not always going to be easy. Satan's always after you. And when you go through stuff, I know you're convinced that nobody else has gone through what you've gone through. Nobody else possibly could understand. Sadly, or I don't know, sadly is the right word for it, reality is, the Bible says, yes, people have gone through various versions of this. And uh, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, starting with uh, verse 5, says, For this reason, give all diligence, add your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control. It's a self-control perseverance. Perseverance means you've got to keep enduring. Perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. But these things... Uh, are yours and abound that you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf. So say, okay, this is okay. I want to keep this in my life. No. If you do these things, you'll never stumble. And for so, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of the Lord. You can become part of the kingdom of God. We are to be diligent. Keep the days of love and bread. We're not supposed to tolerate sin. We're supposed to promote love. By keeping the days of love and bread, Christians picture they've heard the word of God, accepted the sacrifice of Jesus, try to put the word of God into practice, and have symbolically put false religion and sin out of their lives. By keeping the days of love and bread, we show we're willing to obey God over traditions of men. Don't be puffed up, rely on false arguments, 
to keep you from obeying God and the Bible and the practices of those who knew Jesus. Now in conclusion, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, Therefore, let us keep the feast. Shouldn't you? This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.